Hi everyone, this is Ms. Leia and in this video, we're going to talk about image formation in mirrors, specifically the following learning targets, starting from this one. Now, as you recall, plane mirrors are mirrors that have flat reflective surface and they form images that are upright, same height as the object, and are virtual. In contrary to plane mirrors, spherical mirrors look like as if they had been cut off from spherical surface. The first type of spherical mirror is the concave mirror, which bulges away from the object. So this one is the reflective side and the object would be here. Some of the examples of concave mirrors are shaving mirrors and dental mirrors that are both capable of magnifying images. Now we have the convex mirror or diver diverging mirror, which bulges towards the object instead. So it's the opposite of concave mirrors. Now, the reflective side of the convex mirror faces this way, and the object would be here. So, the bump is facing the object. Example of convex mirrors are the ones you see in department stores or what you call surveillance mirrors, and car side mirrors are also convex mirrors. Now, for the ray diagram for, for spherical mirrors, we need to define a couple of terms for us to easily discuss this particular topic. So the first term we're going to define for the ray diagram in concave mirrors is the term principal axis. So if you think of a mirror as a section of this particular sphere, the principal axis would be the line passing through the center of that sphere. Next is the center of curvature. What is the center of curvature? Again, if you imagine the mirror as a part of this particular sphere, the center of curvature would simply be the center of the sphere, which is this point. Next, we have the vertex. The vertex is simply the point where the principal axis meets the mirror, and it's also the geometric center of the mirror itself. Next, we have the focal point. What is the focal point? It is the point midway between the vertex and the center of curvature, and it's represented by capital letter F. Next, we have the radius of curvature. What exactly is the radius of curvature? Once again, we have to imagine the mirror as a part of this particular sphere, and the radius of that sphere would be the radius of curvature of the mirror that has been cut off from this sphere. The next term we're going to define is the focal length, which is simply the distance from the mirror to the focal point. So you can notice in this illustration that the focal length is actually half the length of the radius of curvature. Therefore, F or focal length equals radius of curvature divided by 2. We have to remember this one because it's needed in the mathematical discussion in the next videos. Remember also that the symbol or abbreviation for focal length is a small letter F. The one for focal point, by the way, is capital F. So don't confuse those two abbreviations. Now, what are the rules of reflection for concave mirrors, or how do we apply the law of reflection if we have concave mirrors? If you remember, in the previous video we, with the plane mirrors, it's actually easy to apply the law of reflection because it says that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection, and those two angles are measured with respect to the normal line. Now, the normal line is perpendicular to the surface. And the normal line is easy to determine if you have a flat surface. However, how do we apply the law of reflection if it's hard to identify the normal line given that we have a curved surface or a curved mirror? So the key is we have a set of rules that will work and that can allow us to, to apply the law of reflection with so much simplicity. But first, we have to assume that this arrow is our sample object that faces this reflective side of this concave mirror. Now, take note that it's, it's been a practice to use arrows in ray diagrams because of its simplicity. And aside from that, it has a well-defined tip and bottom region. So we're going to use arrows in ray diagrams. Now, the first thing we have to do is that the incident ray that passes parallel to the principal axis results to a reflected ray that passes through the focal point. And the, um, and the law of reflection applies there. Okay? Now, 
we're not gonna look at that yet. We're gonna go back to that later. But remember that we cannot have any idea about the image location of this particular object if you only have one pair of incident ray and reflected ray. So what we're gonna do next is we're gonna project another incident and reflected right light from that same point for us to know the image location. So coming from that same point, the next rule is that the incident ray that passes through the focal point results to a reflected ray parallel to the principal axis. So this would be the reflected ray, okay? Now, the next thing we're gonna do is that we're gonna identify where the image is. And just recall from the previous video that the intersection of those two reflected rays that are traced from the same point in the object would be the location of the image. So for example, those two reflected rays, this is their intersection. And because we trace them from the tip of the object or the arrow, therefore their intersection would be the tip of that arrow or object. So it's gonna be like this. But how did we know that the bottom of this image should also be touching the principal axis? There's a shortcut. For example, if the bottom of the object lies upon the principal axis, the bottom of the image should also lie upon the principal axis. Now to justify that further, we have a separate material for you to learn why that shortcut works, why we assume that the bottom of the object or end image should consistently be touching the principal axis. But it's, that's not gonna be discussed in full details in this particular video. Now, I told you before that those two rules are actually the key towards applying the law of reflection if you have this curved type or spherical type of mirror. So actually, if you try to estimate this particular surface in the mirror to be a flat surface, and then you can easily draw a normal line then because you're estimating that this is a straight or, or a flat surface rather. So if you draw a normal line from there, you can actually see that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. So in short, those two rules are actually correct. And these have been pre-established by people who are really good at geometry for us to easily do this ray diagram without really having to practically measure the normal line, the angle of incidence, etc. Okay, for the image characteristics, it's minimized because we can see that this object is bigger compared to this image. It's also inverted and it's also a real image. How do we know if it's a real image based on the ray diagram? It's simple. If it's on the reflective side of the mirror, it's a real image. And as a consequence of being on that reflective side, it's actually formed by the reflected rays themselves. It's not formed by the projections or extensions of reflected rays or light rays. As a consequence, because you have a real image, you can project that particular image on the screen or on a piece of paper. Meaning to say, if you like practically put a screen or anything where, where light can be uh, shed on, that image will be formed in that object. Let's say a piece of paper or any type of screen, Let's specifically if it's white, right? Okay. Now, uh, an example of real image is the one being formed in movie projectors, okay? So that's an example of a real image because those are actual light rays that are being projected on a screen. So unlike virtual light rays or unlike virtual images, real images can be projected on a screen because they're generated by real or legit light rays. Now, for practice, I already set up this ray diagram for this concave mirror whose object is place on this side of the focal point, between the focal point and the vertex of the mirror. What I want you to do is to try choosing the correct image characteristics in this particular table. So at this point, please pause the video and answer mentally or using a scratch paper. At this point, I'll be revealing the answers. For the size, we can see that the image is bigger than the object, so the answer there should be enlarged. For the orientation, it's obviously upright. And for the kind of image, the correct answer is virtual because it's behind the reflective side of the mirror and we can see that it's not formed by actual reflected rays. We can see that those are just dashed lines which are actually the extensions of these reflected light rays 
So this is not a real image, it's a virtual image, meaning to say it's only in our minds, right? Because if you, let's say for example, if you stood on this side of the mirror, your brain would tell you that those reflected light rays are actually traveling along a straight line path. So your brain would tell you, this is where these, lights, these light rays are coming from and this is where the image is. So this is only in your mind. Okay, so it's not gonna be, it's never gonna be projected on a screen or something because they're not, this image is not generated by actual light rays. Okay, now how about for convex mirrors? The first thing you should notice for convex mirror is that it bulges towards the object. So if this is the object, the bump is facing the object. And because it's shaped like that, if you extend a convex mirror in a full circle or a sphere, you should realize that the center of curvature would be on this side. It would be at the back of the mirror. Same for focal point. And also the radius of curvature will be on this side. Now, how do we apply the rules of reflection for convex mirrors? They're actually pretty similar to the one in concave mirrors, except that uh, there's a, there are slight differences because of this kind of scenario. So the first thing we're going to do is that if you have an incident ray, that travels parallel to the principal axis, the reflected ray will be projected such that the extension passes through the focal point, right? Miss Leia, it's, is it not possible that the reflected ray passes to the focal point just like it happens in concave mirrors? The answer is no. You cannot make that reflected ray pass through the focal point because obviously it will not penetrate through the surface of the mirror. So it will bounce off. But what the rule says is that the extension of the reflected ray should pass through the focal point like this. Now, the second one is that an incident ray that travels towards the focal points results to a reflected ray parallel to the principal axis. So you can see that this incident ray is headed towards the focal point, And if that is the case, the reflected ray will be parallel to the principal axis. Now, once again, what we need to do is to extend those two reflected rays and their intersection will tell us the location of this particular point in the, in the object, which is the tip of the arrow, right? But if you extend those reflected rays forward, they're not going to meet, right? So we're going to extend them backwards instead. And it will look something like this. So we extended this reflected ray backwards. Same for the second reflected ray. And the intersection will tell us the location of the point in the object that we are tracing, which is the tip of the arrow. So this intersection will be the tip of the image. So it's going to look something like this. Okay, what does it tell us? It tells us that the image characteristics is virtual because it's behind the mirror, it's upright, and it's diminished or minimized because this is the object, and if this is the image, this is obviously smaller than the object. In fact, for convex mirrors, the image is always virtual, upright, and diminished or minimized. Now, in concave mirrors, by the way, concave mirrors can actually maximize or, or magnify, or it can also minimize, but for convex mirrors, they can only minimize, okay? So that's why their purposes are the, like, let's say, for example, so in the surveillance mirrors we see in, in the supermarket, for example, that's an example of, of convex mirrors. Same for side car, as car side mirrors, because convex mirrors can minimize the object. And in that case, it also gives us a wider field of view, just like how they want those surveillance mirrors to work. They want a wider field of view, although it compromises image size. Same for car side mirrors. But of course, the radius of curvature of those mirrors are, are being chosen or being designed so that these mirrors can ser serve their right purpose. So take note that it doesn't matter whether you're a concave or a convex mirror, or what I mean is that it doesn't matter how shape, how, what your shape is. It doesn't matter what kind of person you are, but all the characteristics that have been given to you by your creator are all there in you because you have a certain purpose. Now for the next video, we're gonna talk about the problem solving using the mirror equation. That's all for this video. Have a great day.